Hi Bane, welcome Hi. to the fourth episode of Paradise Talks. <laughs> so sorry for our uh, great moderator Zaid. We love him <laughs> so much by now. Yeah. Maybe we should look into other people to help us with this podcast since he's such a great person with scheduling. Yeah, hi. We're welcome to have you. Um, hi, I am very glad to be here. And let me introduce myself. My name is Bana Fadl. Uh, I'm a second year English major with a minor in political science and translation. I started AUIS in 2019, the fateful year. Yeah. Yeah. And my journey was cut short because we only were here for three weeks. And I took a leave of absence after that. So technically, I started my university journey in 2020. Yeah. And I'm interested in literature mainly. Yeah. Um, to be specific, uh, literary fiction and poetry. That's my main interest. And I love reading about experiences. Yeah, so you signed in at 2019, but you started UGR 2020, right? Because yeah. of you didn't need any APP or that stuff. So based on your experience have you seen it's better to go through that preparatory program or just to start ug well i feel like one of the mistakes that was not on my part when i first came to this university is that i come from a public school but i had a pretty good english level so it allowed me to pass through the entrance exam and my grades were high enough that i didn't need to go through the APP. However, I did not have any training in writing essays and uh, citation and a lot of this research stuff that is missing from the public school system, uh, which kind of set me back a while in my first semester. I didn't know what I was doing and it was quite an awful experience, to be honest. I withdrew yeah. most of my classes that semester yeah. because, yes, I could speak English. I could understand what was going on, but I didn't know how to study. And that's something quite different in your university experience. It's not about memorization. Like, it's not about, you know, there is a textbook. You study it. You come, you take the exam. And then you pass. It's not like that. You kind of, especially for the social sciences, you really need to absorb the big ideas, which needs a different kind of studying method. So that was uh, my experience. However, I don't have positive beliefs regarding any language learning Program. programs. Yeah. yeah. Because I feel like language is better acquired naturally like just the way you know when you're a child how do you pick up language you just pick it up through hearing through experiencing and then you move on to like reading and other stuff which is not present in these programs they just give you tons of grammar and tons of reading yeah well it also depends on like which instructor are you taking the the program is because mm-hmm. my experience is quite different. I couldn't pass the exam, so I only took like one level of English, which is like not that a lot, not, not that much. But we had it luckily with like one of the best instructors, uh, Ms. Alex, and we had like the, so they condensed the program. It was mm-hmm. like supposedly 13 weeks as a regular semester, but now it's just 10 weeks, so it's more hours per class. And both of the reading and writing classes it was done by just one instructor so she designed it in a way that they would go hand in hand since she's the one like supervising the whole thing and actually we did quite some reading like we had like project portfolio at the end of the semester and where we had to like finish a book throughout an entire semester and then uh, write a portfolio about it but the most important thing is not wasn't only about like reading and as you said like language is very difficult to pick up in a few courses it's, you have to be practice it and you have to take your time with it until it, 
becomes better and better by throughout experience but the thing is it's not like the grammar things were good but mainly it was helping us with how to be a good college student because we were like for the 10 weeks we were just annotating citing stuff uh, we wrote some essays but not a lot but the main focus was about like annotation and citation and highlighting stuff and how to skim uh, huge reading because like to be fair you are not going to read like the full textbooks throughout college i mean you are supposed to <laughs> but i don't think uh, many people do that so they just like skim for the main idea which is what we did for 10 weeks so that was so helpful because when i see like students like your case when who are like very good in english but they are suffering in the department of like annotation and citation and all of the stuff that we learned in these 10 weeks uh, it was like uh, i thank god that I, I i went through that process and especially uh, your first period at, at uni you are going to uh, have to adapt so adapting throughout app is much easier than adapting with like ug classes and everything I think that was, but of course, like for language, I know many students who like past AP people, their language sucks, so it has to be like your own efforts and everything, yeah. I agree, and the thing you mentioned about time, I think it's overlooked yeah. when it comes to these programs, because if a program promises you they can take you from knowing zero English to being a fluent speaker in like no, I don't a year or two, possible, that's yeah. bullshit. Yeah. Like, you can't do that. It takes a lot of, like, natural acquirement of the language, like, just throughout your own desire to learn. Yeah, I think that's possible if you live, like, outside here. Mm. Because, like, living here, you are just going to speak English during class time. Especially in the beginning, where, like, most of your classmates are still on your, like, academic level, so you're just going to speak native language with them. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's basically just five hours a day in APP, so, yeah. But the thing is, um, if you don't have, like, a initiative to learn the language, yeah, you won't learn of course, it. Yeah. For me, the initiative was, I was, like, very disconnected with the reality I was growing up in, like, <laughs> yeah. always. Yeah. And... Learning English, like, opened so many doors for me, yeah. like, especially when it came to reading um, and, like, YouTube. Like, I learned English through YouTube, basically. Yeah. And I feel like, especially when it comes to Arabic, which is my kind of, in a way, my mother language, there are so many missing resources. There are so many ideologies pushed through these resources, yeah. which is present with, you know, English media, but it's not as much. Like, with a lot of the resources I would find in Arabic, they would be through either a political or a religious yeah, lens. Yeah, of course, yeah. So the resources were not reliable, yeah. so I felt like I needed to learn English. And a lot of these students that go through the APP, which I believe it's not as rigorous as it used to be, Yeah are coming out not really knowing how to convey their thoughts. They don't know how to, like, just have a conversation that is not, you know, something you speak about in class. Yeah. You know, these everyday talking... Conversations, yeah. Understanding, like, humor, which I feel yeah, like... Yeah, that, that's the most, like, that's the maximum level you can get in a language when you can make jokes and understand, like, the hidden jokes and, like, the small talks and everything. That's where you reach the maximum level because it's really hard to uh, bend language into humor that's like the most difficult thing you can do with language yeah i see yeah but that's the thing i feel like that's the fun part of it and through academia we miss out on that part yeah for me it was like a similar story but i didn't like begun with an intent to learn english so it all happened naturally like i i was watching movies through couple of years now with subtitles and just one day our internet connection dropped out so I had to watch the movie without any subtitles and surprisingly I understood like most of it much more than I anticipated to so I said mm, I, I know English <laughs> right now yeah and that's like I think the best way to start it's to like develop your vocabulary and everything 
so yeah you because like then the part about like learning how to connect these words and establish conversations next because without like vocabulary and like strong fundamentals about grammar and vocabulary you can't make like efficient conversations that is true but i feel like at least for me the way i learned grammar was not for a textbook like i just heard so much yeah, exactly, yeah. it forms like this mental grammar which to me is much better than oh the rule because you can't you know, juggle all of these rules in your head while you're trying to speak, that's yeah, it's, it's very hard. Yeah, it's supposed to come like second nature to you. Exactly. Yeah. So, you talked about like, having pushed ideologies throughout like, religion and politics and uh, Arabian texts. What can you elaborate Can more? I elaborate more? Well, um, I just always felt like alienated from the community I was in. Because when you are just a person who has doubts and you go after these doubts and suddenly your reality starts falling apart and you can't really talk to anyone about it because we just don't live in an open communication community. Everything is very behind the doors. Everything is like even the books I would want to read the political ones, like you can't just go to a library and ask for it. Like it has to be through a connection. Or I just read on my phone for a long time. And it is because, partly because of the political state of Iraq and the Middle East in general, uh, which is very torn apart and everyone is kind of scared scared of like this existential threat at all times there's always an enemy there is someone somewhere in the middle east fighting for their simplest human rights so i think it's related to like how we came this way it's because like how in the past it was it was like an actual danger for you to ask about like government stuff, religious stuff, it, I mean, it, no, it's not like it has been changed a lot. That's like, I think it developed so much into like our background and our like way of thinking, especially our parents, because they are the ones who are asking us not to like uh, acquire about like this unnecessary stuff. So it's basically like it's out of fear and they are trying to protect you by like not dying for like asking about the wrong thing because we hear about like all these stories how the, this entire family died because like uh, uh, she said like her dad was talking shit about like Saddam Hussein or like uh, how uh, people who die just because like they inquired or they insulted like uh, a religious figure so it is like coming throughout that thought process that these are silly stuff and you you don't need, like, the benefits of you, like, finding out or solving your doubt is much less than, like, uh, getting killed over acquiring this information. So I think they are protecting us throughout that way, but they are also, like, making this, like, uh, forbidden food for so many people, and especially in your, like, teenage years where you have, like, your hormones to the level where you, <laughs> you want to rebel against everything, so... That's where, like, most of what I see, like, this newest generation come from. Like, they try to push the boundaries towards, like, religion and politics. And and they should because, like, it's not providing their uh, essentials and what they need as, like, a human being. So, why not? Like, if you're, you're risking getting killed, but if you don't, you're living a life that might not be worth living. So. I see. Actually, um... Uh, a few years ago, I read a book that I feel tackles this question quite well. It was called Haywanatul yeah. Insan by Mamdu Hadwan. Um, yeah. Basically talks about like how these uh, very suppressive systems break down the character of its citizens to the point where, you know, it dehumanizes them. It makes them like animals. So they're like easier to lead, like a herd. And... In a way, I feel like 
When I came here to Sully and especially the AYS community, I lost touch with reality. Yeah. Because here everyone is very woke and very. Very woke, yeah. Mm, very yeah. woke. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and they have this persona of being very open minded and accepting of different ideologies and religious beliefs. So it was quite a shock going back home. And I feel like this university does this a lot. It is its own echo chamber. Yeah. Where it's quite a different experience from like even outside Sully. Right? Yeah. Like just go to the bazaar and see yeah. how different it is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So like, uh, yeah, as I said, like it starts like from this young age and then you would like develop this persona based on what you most interact with, which is like internet and social media because it's providing something that makes sense to you and it's more satisfi- satisfactory than like the real world per se because like most of the influencers and people you see out online are people who are pushing for agendas that doesn't go well with our like traditional arabian way of living so you develop that and it becomes like the whole persona for many many students so anyways like i think everyone is affected by like yeah we are all westernized in one way or yeah another. we are all westernized yeah because the thing is i definitely went through that phase where yep. i basically threw away everything related to my own heritage and my old culture All of my culture I just threw it away because I was like, it's misogynistic, it's sexist, it's awful, you know, because, you know, with the effects of imperialism, colonialism here, you see how we hate ourselves so much. We hate our identity and we were made to feel that way. And it wasn't until I took a few classes in political science that were focused on the region and I started reading like more... Uh, for thinkers from this region that I felt like actually no we can't just dismiss everything in our culture because everyone has their own identity and we should not be shamed Um, we should not be shamed for our history you know Uh, it is true we have problematic parts of our culture but that doesn't mean we need to throw it all away and adopt this Western one as the superior. Yeah. I think it's also like how, like, as you come older, you would, like, start evaluating, like, your values and, like, why do you think this way? And, and you would start looking at how these people might, like, have a reason to do these things, like, this way. It's basically, like, because, like, how... The, the nature is here and how like people communicate and how people deal with like daily stuff so like you would start uh, not appreciating but like understanding why these people think this way whereas like an younger age you would just say like that's like so backward and so outdated and you should drop that and adopt like a new way of thinking mm-hmm. yeah and yeah I mean it's, it's understandable that people think differently all around the world, but yeah, it's quite a notice, noticeable thing that how many people here at uni like adopt some certain ideologies and certain political agendas. Yeah. Mm-hmm. See, with again going back to that book I spoke about, Haywanatul um, Insan, it mentions something how once we kind of start hating our own identity yeah. like these let's say outsiders can take over and that is a process that you can see very clearly with a lot of our you know how in kind of like this new young Iraqi society is divided into the cool kids who speak English yeah, and the bad like, boys yeah exactly <laughs> yeah. and then you have the normies the yeah. people who are just you know, your day-to-day kind of... You're normal people. And I don't mean normal, like, as an insult. As a bad connotation. No, that. because, like, they, they're just people of their culture and they are comfortable with that and that's it. But we see, like, this kind of superiority complex going around with 
the cool people who speak English. And that, like, English has become such a, like, it's like a personality trait. And to yeah. someone who, you know, has passed that, it's like, no. Like, actually, your own language is beautiful. Yeah. And people wish they could have as much, you know, especially with Arabic. I love Arabic. It just saddens me sometimes how I see so many young boys and girls when they start reading, they only read in English. Yeah. They don't dive into the treasures we have in our own culture, which is sad because you can't improve society unless you work with what you what have. You have yeah. You can't like go bring all of these radical ideas and be like, okay, now you have to start believing this because your thought process is sexist, misogynistic, homophobic. You can't. Um, because it's harder for people who are from our generation and the previous generations to just blindly accept this new ideology because it just doesn't align with their beliefs and what they have been told throughout their whole life. You, we need like better strategies to incorporate these more open dialogues in a respectful way because when you talk to someone as if you know more than they do they're automatically gonna hate you and not want to listen to you yeah and that's like the other thing about like how the arabian culture is like structurized and why like so many people start going the other way is that it's not developed for like having real conversations like uh, it's basically, as a kid, you start getting all these, like, uh, culture stuff and traditions and informations laid out on you. You have to believe them, believe in them and start going on instead of, like, questioning stuff, actually, and having real conversations, which is, like, one of the reasons that I started this podcast. It's to have, like, real conversations with people. That's, like, such a huge thing for especially people people from the other gen like the older generation it's like how even if they decided to like have a real conversation it would be with people who they would kind of know what are their beliefs so they wouldn't like uh, step on the wrong territory as we said because like how dangerous it is to offend someone religiously or politically in this region it's might be like even fatal so hopefully we are like going to have place especially after like uh, the rebellion that happened it's not completely rebellion but people like protested ag against the system for so long and especially it manifested in 2019 it's it's effect like politically it's maybe not that obvious but i think it's effect like on the newer generation and how to uh, stand up against like the wrongful things in your life and start claiming what's rightfully yours is much more important than like a change in the political system because like these things can even happen and the old system would still be in place like just changing a couple of political figures isn't going to solve the problem it's like very incremental change that goes through generations and generations until you have like uh, a place where people would like different beliefs and different identities that can coexist and excel in what they are good at. Hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. Well, for the 2019 protests, it was actually one of the most, like, important moments of my adolescent life, you know, in my teen years, because I've never felt so connected to my nation until I saw these young people my age protesting for freedom and, you know f freedom in general the western freedom. values yeah, yeah. <laughs> see yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but like we really need that and democracy is a sham here like absolutely we don't have democracy yeah it's like such a such a weird thing to have like democracy in iraq yeah, we How can't even imagine like? it. <laughs> How would that look like? <laughs> yeah. uh, it's so like far out of our reach that it's funny to us. Oh my god, democracy. I what can say whatever about? I want. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Which, again, I felt very connected to the movement and 
I even went out to my old university back in Kirkuk where I used to be an engineer. Yeah. Um, Good times. <laughs> yeah. yeah, back when STEM had me. Yeah. But no longer. Uh, we used to go out on these protests like around university and the areas around it. And, you know, I've never been in a protest, but it feels great to be yeah. to feel like you're a part of something. And social media played a huge role. Like I would constantly be on Twitter, yeah, just looking the at the platform news. <laughs> for people. Yeah. So you have some criticisms? Yeah, I love the platform. <laughs> yeah. The best. I see. Yeah. Very reliable information. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, especially on the trending hashtags. Yeah, mm-hmm. best information ever. Uh Yeah. The trending. Yeah. Uh so with the, um, with that. It kind of sparked in me this desire to be involved in politics. Yeah. Like before 2019, I was aware, you know, that I probably politically am somewhere on the left. Yeah. But when it 2019 came and I started researching uh, more, like there are so many terms that I didn't know, like what is the difference uh, between, like the concrete differences between, you know. Uh, Jumhur, how do you say? Like being a republic country or like a democratic country. Yeah, like, like what are the differences between a republican and a democratic country? Yeah. Uh, our own... Um, the, state, uh, the constitution. Yeah, our constitution. Like when I actually read the constitution, it's so flawed yeah. and it just baffled me, you know? Yeah. I lived here for what? I was 19 at the time. I lived... 19 years i went to school for 12 years and no one mentioned how our constitution has a contradiction in the first five pages like which contradiction i don't um i think uh the one i read basically says uh, you have freedom of speech and also you can't say anything that offends religious beliefs (laughs) like all of the same (laughs) like you can go both ways exactly so if you are in a court of law it just depends on which the who. judge, huh? yeah, the personality of the judge and how much they are paying. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, I feel like I lived in a safe space before yeah. getting introduced to politics, yeah. and I no longer have that naivete or innocence, which in a way has made me less radical, mm. and has made me more like aim for realistic changes based off of the reality I see. Mm not based off of what I think reality should be, which I think is a problem with a lot of these young activists. They can only imagine the reality they want, not the reality that they're currently living in. And, like, maybe, like, the other argument against, like, this point should be, like, if you aim for, like, small changes, maybe you wouldn't, like achieve them and you have nothing but like if you aim toward like these idealized values even if you go like a little bit that would be much more than just like aiming for these small incremental changes so it it, it can be like argued both ways but what you're saying seems like the more rational approach to it and the one that causes less harm maybe and less uh, deaths we, we don't need more of that apparently in our country and yeah, I think that's what people should start like working on instead like of just trying to overthrow everything. Maybe you should like just enhance it a little bit, like step step by step process. I see, and I definitely sympathize with those people because I was one of them. Yeah. Um, I see that it hurts them. It's a very emotional. Like, there is this emotional part of politics that I think is overlooked. Sometimes, like, you really get heated when you see all of these people uh, going to jail and being kidnapped and even murdered. I mean, you should. Yeah, Yeah. it's like, it's very emotional, yet we are expected to stay calm and be like, okay, slow, slow, change. Yeah. Uh, But yeah, of course, yeah. You are driven by these emotions, and I feel like some emotions during those protests were misplaced Mm. which led to a lot of chaos it was very unorganized which was 
part of the problem, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, like, how can you organize such a thing? I mean, you are going to, you are going to, like, ask for, like, overthrow of government. That's not like, it's like an appeal that you upload to an instructor to change your grade. <laughs> <laughs> it's much different, I mean. These people are so ingrained in the system that they just can't imagine themselves without it. And they are so well connected, it's like a whole network of corruption and bad figures. So it's not going to be a way by like, just, I don't know, it's, <sighs> this is such a like complex question to answer. Like, should you go full radical with protest where like you get people killed and like so many like we even know like people who said like why did so many people die and not that much of change happened but if you go about like what we instead about like the incremental change then is it a sure thing that it's going to influence change i feel like um where you're coming from is basically do we combat violence that was done to us with more violence yeah and that is Again, a very complex question because, okay, how do we measure which people to sacrifice? Like, that's such a... Yeah. It's an unthinkable thing. Yeah, mostly, like, throughout history, what we have seen is that it's the people who got the most damage, which are, like, the lower classes and the poor people. Exactly, and we saw that here, too, unfortunately. Like, the southern governments, they suffered a lot in these protests, and... Till this day, they're still chasing the activists who were a part of it. Some of them, the lucky ones, got away and they live in other countries now. But the ones who are here, they're still suffering for standing up to their beliefs. It's such a weird country to live in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, it's our country at least. Yeah, it's, it's our ours. Country, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like, I don't know, like with people that fled the country and you can, like, they talk all the time about, like, how great living in this new place and everything. But, like, I think deep down they are just so sad that they are not living in their own country. I see. Yeah. I used to always fantasize about going and living abroad and getting away from this awful, awful Shit place. place. Huh? Yeah. yeah. Um, but, again, I feel like the more... The more years pass by and I live here, especially Suli. Suli's gorgeous. Yeah, I love Suli. It's I love best. Suli too. Yeah. Suli fan club. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just feel settled, you know? Yeah. I feel at home in a way and I feel like... Not I would... at home in a way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It goes but like you are at home, but you're not at home. Yeah, it is my own home, you know? The one yeah. I created, not the one that was given to me. Yeah. And I feel like with... When you belong to like marginalized groups and when you belong to these outsider groups of society, it's more about the things you choose. Like your, my, your friends are kind of your chosen family. Yeah. So sometimes you feel closer to them. And same with the city. It's like my chosen home, my chosen people. Yeah, I can definitely 100% relate to that. Relate to that. It's you know, much different than anywhere in the South living here. It's ah, uh, it suits. It suits. I think it suits us much better to live here than like other where like other governments and stuff. So, should we talk about arts and movies? All right. Yeah. So you wanted to start like with talking about the bad one. So yeah. Yes. How was that? I loved the new Batman film. Yeah. I am a big fan of emo boy Batman yeah. who is not Batman yet so um, uh, one of the things I really liked about this film is like it's an origin story without yeah. it saying it you know very it's explicitly an yeah. and in a way if you compare it to my other favorite Batman film which is no Dark one's Knight. Batman yeah, Dark Knight or the entire trilogy no the I first want to, one yeah the first one, yeah, because, like, I've heard, like, yesterday I was, like, listening to this, uh, there are these two people who does, like, movie reviews in Arabic, uh, Film Gamed and Maher Muslim, so they were talking about, like, because Maher did, like, an entire episode comparing the Dark Knight to the Batman, and, like, one of the things that was, like, uh, like, 
criticizing the videos why didn't you since the batman is going to be like part of like other like movies why didn't you compare it to the first batman and he said like which is like quite like frankly because like batman begins it's all in the title it's how he began his like mm -hmm. he turned from like uh, the poor kid who is an orphan and lost everything to like the entire process of how, how he got there and we see him as Batman like um, only in the third act of the movie or something like that whereas in this movie it's true that it's the first like part of this like new trilogy hopefully but we already st see him in the business so he's already starting as Batman we don't see like his origins that's why like he said like it's a fair comparison to care it, to compare it with like the Dark Knight which is like also a movie about like how he just started doing like his Batman thingies and he kept on doing that but I think like with with this movie it's like so much better doing it like how he's starting to like learn how to de do all of this stuff is like how he differentiates between like his two characters his Bruce uh, Bruce Wayne and like his Batman character and yeah there is so much potential and like where this can go it's such a great movie yeah i know because i was about to say how he's not batman yet he's very awkward yeah. like um people are scared of him so the movie opens up and he's trying to save someone yeah and the person he's trying to save is terrified from him and because in a way he is this kind of new to this whole superhero thing He's just trying to figure it out. Yeah. He's still battling the inner conflict with um, this Batman uh, is very intriguing to me. Yeah. Like the way he tries to balance being Bruce Wayne, that the role he hates. Yeah, uh, in this movie, don't see him doing that as much. He he loves just being the Batman. He doesn't seem to like in the dark knight and begins he seems much more like capable of like being the playboy being the millionaire who uh with all like his cars and women and everything but like in this one he seems to hate all of that and he just want to like contribute to his family's legacy by doing what he's doing as a vigilante yeah. i see and the thing is he's very vulnerable like his character yeah. like i don't know for me he's in a way the most uh, open Batman because if you think about it, someone who had his parents murdered in front, in front of, of him, him, yeah, as a child, as a child, and he lived this lavish life yeah. that was so lonely. He only had his butler to yeah. take care of him, and he just all he could think about is revenge, vengeance. Course, yeah. So for me, this Batman makes so much sense, mm. and I love the way Robert played him. Yeah, same. I mean, he, Great he did that all of his life, definitely. Uh, and like, also, if we like look at the other Batman's, like with, with like Christian Bale's one with with Nolan, uh, he like started with like learning all these like ninja techniques from like this organization and whatnot and Trasa Ghoul and everything. But like, he immediately like picked up like how to be. How to defeat evil with being good but in this one we start seeing him like no actually he is like seemingly one of the villains of the movie he's like uh, and it could be like a fair point to be made that uh, this is going to be hitting the kind of spoilery area the movie like the riddler did use batman to achieve like his master plan he was like his puppet throughout most of the movie so it could be made like the batman is the villain of the movie but yeah, like, it seems like it's a very good arc how he moved from, like, this person who wants vengeance for his family to actually understanding what his family's hidden secrets are and how to conclude with a great arc about, like, I don't want to do it with vengeance more, I want to do it with, like, being, by well, influencing good and, like, mm -hmm. advertising for hope. Yeah, yeah, and I love, like, one of the last frames in the movie is this woman reaching out for him yeah and she's like not scared she's not scared of him anymore. yeah she's not scared. He, he, he like hit like his most realization point when he was like 
fighting at the stadium, I think, where mm-hmm. like one of the Riddler's fanboys, which is very funny about like how he used to do these streams on online about like uh, giving contributions to other and asking what to bring to the like which kind of rifles and which kind of bullets. So when like he started hitting this guy and he revealed his mask. He said, I'm vengeance. So he said, like, oh, shit, I did a huge mistake. <laughs> I shouldn't be advertising for vengeance. I should be advertising for, like, hope and promise and everything. Yeah, it's a great, it's an amazing movie. Yeah. And hopefully they would, like, do new stuff with the second one. Like, not only repeating the good stuff that was in this one, but hopefully, like, studios won't fuck it up for the second one. Oh, when is the second one scheduled? Yeah, I don't think it's like still official yet about like when it is. But I mean, as long as it makes money, so people <laughs> are going to still watch it. I know I'm gonna be looking forward to that. Yeah, same. Uh, so if we compare it to Batman Begins, which one is more your favorite, and then we can compare it to Dark Knight. <laughs> See, it's a hard question yeah. because uh, Batman is very fresh in my mind. Yeah. But Batman Begins, it's like the thing, it feels like home, I don't know, like the, I'm not into superhero movies, but with the Dark Knight trilogy. Yeah, I'm not into superhero movies as well. (laughs) Like, uh, with the Dark Knight trilogy? Yeah. Uh, It's very, like, nostalgic to me, because we used to watch it on NBC2. Yeah, of course we did, yeah. And we watched it as a family, Mm. so nostalgia might play a part, but I feel like, I like the new Batman movie. Then Batman begins? Movie. Yeah. Uh, what about Dark Knight? The Dark Knight, I feel like it's quite different. I yeah. don't know how would you compare them. So. Yeah, that's what like, the me. entire point of like Maher's video about like how he was comparing everything like the vehicle, the villains, the acting, Alfred, each like he broke it down to so much detail. But I don't know, like we still need to see how this movie would age because like the Dark Knight aged perfectly. Because some mm-hmm. movies you would see them like, like 10 years afterwards and it's what the fuck I'm watching. <laughs> <laughs> but some movies just like aged like fine wine, like The Godfather and other classics. So The Dark Knight pulled it off, but we have to see for Batman, like how would this entire trilogy go on and everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Maybe it's more than a trilogy, maybe it's just one, like six movies or just one movie, you don't know. With DC you never know. It's mm-hmm. the planning, it's... <laughs> All over the place. <laughs> you maybe see like another version of Batman next year. You don't know. It's it's all over the place. Yeah. I see. Yeah. So yeah, since we started talking about like movies, what what do you like about them? How do you think about theaters? Everything. Um. Uh, well, for me, the first time I ever went to a cinema because we didn't have a cinema at Cook yeah. was in Sully. In 2017. That's very recent. Yeah. Yeah. So I just had the watching a movie on my phone or on my laptop experience, which is very sad. Say watching a movie on my phone ever (laughs) again. Yeah. Well, I was illiterate. Yeah. And uneducated and uncivilized. (laughs) Uncivilized. Yeah. That's a very very nice label. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Um. So for the most part, I loved watching movies after reading books so Mm. because when you read a book you kind of picture every character and the setting and you know the atmosphere and then i'd watch the movie and i would look at another interpretation of the same concept the director's vision basically exactly and sometimes uh, not to be biased or anything, but mine was better. <laughs> yeah. Because, like, they leave so much out of movies. So I'm more of a book person. But I kind of, like, always made sure I would watch a few movies every once in a while. Uh, because with movies, uh, I, I felt like I could find more people to connect to rather than books. Like, when I'd sit down with someone or my friends, we'd just talk about the movies we watch, not usually the books. Um, but... Speaking of that, I wanted to talk about uh, one of my favorite movies. It's called Kill Your Darlings. Mm. It's basically surrounded around these group of beat poets, uh, Jack Kerouac and Allen Ginsberg and William St. Burroughs. 
and it's so chaotic. It's very dark academia, and I love the movie. Uh, Daniel Radcliffe's in it. Really? Yeah. I haven't seen it yet. Yeah. Yeah, with Dane DeHaan, uh, if I'm pronouncing his name right, and it's such a beautiful movie. Like the dialogue is so nice. Cause, mm. You know, they're poets. It's quite pretentious as well, <laughs> which I love. Yeah. Um, but I really enjoyed that. It was like one of the movies that made me want to be an English major. You know, study poetry, be into this kind of elitist society yeah. in a way, because like a lot of academia is about elitism. Something about it enticed me, and it's one of the. I don't. Rewatch movies that often because for me rewatching is like a very special occasion. Like mm. it's very few movies that I want to experience over and over again. But Kill Your Darlings is one of them. Uh, have you seen Dead Poets Society? Yes, of course I have. Yeah, and like, is it like in this realm of like instructor student? perspective or like is it um, more on, on the teacher's side or the student's side so in a way that poet society i'm not a big fan of really why i just didn't connect with it as much because um i don't know i had a personal affection for alan ginsburg i love his poetry mm. so I went into it already kind of loving it because, you know, mm. I love Daniel Radcliffe. I love the actors. I love the poets. But with Dead Poets Society, I think I watched it while I was too young as well, so mm. I didn't connect with it as much. However, um, Goodwill Hunting. Yeah, I love that one. I love that one too. And it's also one of the things that really encouraged me to go into academia. Like, for the future, I do want to get a master's in either literature or poetry and uh, that movie kind of is like always in the, playing out in my mind because uh, I know so many people you know so many goodwills yeah. <laughs> uh, that are just losing so much potential because they their environment and I would think mm -hmm. so um, we have to wrap this up we need to leave so your favorite TV show, you're talking about Fleabag, yeah. Fleabag, it's such an extraordinary show. It won three Emmys and two Golden Globes, and it is that good. Uh, it's very one of those shows that takes you by surprise how much you connect with the character. She's not a good character by any means, as in she's not a good person. Which makes her a good character. Exactly. Yeah. She's not a good person, but she's a great character. You can't hate her. Because she's very funny and witty and she will make you laugh at the most awful situations. Yeah. And you have to love her for that. And for me, my favorite season was season two, which starts with Flea Bag in a bathroom in a restaurant with her nose bleeding. She looks at the camera and she's like, this is a love story. <laughs> and it's so intriguing. And the way that she extended the storyline from season one to season two mm. was so well done yeah. that you didn't feel like it was filler. No episode, no shot in Flea Bag is filler. It's so jam-packed with events and action uh, that in a 20-minute episode, she accomplishes what some TV shows can accomplish in, you know, four or five episodes. Yeah, and I think it's also related to how, like, it was designed. Like, it's... Many TV shows like start with a good beginning and then they start to deplete and they start running out of ideas. But with this one, it just kept getting better and better until it ended, unfortunately, very shortly, just only two seasons. But I think that's better than having like a good TV show and uh, just milking it for seven seasons. It's mm -hmm. just, just losing its image and lose its, like how good the characters are. And one of my friends actually like started Fleabag and he was like hating it so bad about like he was saying like how annoying is she and like are relatable and she does all this stupid stuff. I told him just shut the fuck up and just finish it already. So he sat down, he rewatched it all and he loves it by now. He mm -hmm. said like thank you for doing, <laughs> for doing that for me.
Yeah, I mean, we would love to have you more here, but I guess our time is up. So hopefully in the future we can do part two, maybe. Yeah, with a Jordan Peterson analysis of mm. 12 rules of life. Stay yeah, tuned. that would be the entire <laughs> agenda for episode two. Yeah. yeah, I'm surprised how we went the whole podcast without mentioning his name. I'm proud of us. <laughs> All right, and then, then. The next one. And the next one, yeah. Thank okay. you for having me. It was very interesting to be here and I look forward to your future productions. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for being here. We apologize so much about like all the inconveniences so far, but yeah, it is what it is. No it's worries. It's like podcast done by a college student. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So have a good day, everyone. Thank you for listening. If you are still listening to this point and bye-bye. Bye-bye.